Right, welcome everyone to this Global Trends video series where we discuss some of the key areas in material science, particularly nanotechnology, are having a big impact in the development and innovation of other industry sectors. I mean, this is the second video in our series. The first was on human health, uh, which is currently on um, the Serio Nano website. And today we're going to discuss another area of major global focus, which is future cities. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Liam Critchley. I'm a subject matter expert in chemistry and nanotechnology. And I'm joined today with Landon Mertz, the CEO of Serio Nanomaterials. Hi, Landon. Hey there, Liam. Uh, if you don't mind, before we get into the subject, uh, do you want to tell us a bit about uh, Serio? Yeah, so so Liam, first of all, great to be here. Uh, Serion Nanomaterials has been around for about 15 years and is one of the largest in the United States for the design, scale up and manufacture of nanomaterials, um, and more specifically metal, metal oxide and ceramic nanoparticles. And uh, our customers are mostly mid cap, large cap companies uh, across the US and Europe. And as a company, Serion doesn't actually develop products. Uh, what we do is we provide companies with access to advanced expertise in nanomaterials when they're trying to leverage nanomaterials in their products. Uh, so basically we're supporting companies cradle to grave from applied research all the way through to uh, manufacturing. Uh, thank you. And what do you see for uh, material science moving forward? Yeah, it's a good question. And uh, you and I discussed this uh, in our last conversation. Uh, so about 10 years ago, the Royal Society of Chemistry had published a, a very large document called the Roadmap for the Future. And what the report was highlighting is that uh, as a society, we're really coming under some pretty tremendous population pressures over the next 50 years. And that's going to have uh, a variety of impacts on our daily lives. And that, it, that's everything from the food supply, health, water and air, uh, the environments we live in, for example, cities. And uh, personally, I believe that their, their assessment uh, and report findings really are spot on. And I really do believe that their conclusion that um, nanomaterials and more broadly material science will play a, an outsized role in addressing these challenges. Yeah, I mean, nanomaterials are starting to penetrate into areas that, you know, not often talked about. We hear about some, but um, as I mentioned earlier, I uh, want to discuss about nanomaterials in future cities. Um, from what, from my experience, when this when this topic of uh, future cities comes up, the instant reaction is to think of smart cities. So we jump automatically to Industry 4.0, big data algorithms, the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and anything on the kind of software-related side and while software and digital transformation are going to be important, it's the innovation in natural, the physical infrastructure underpinning these technologies which in the cities, which is going to play a major role in how society develops and doesn't often get talked about as much. So on this physical side, I feel nanomaterials are going to be playing an increasing role uh, within our cities in the future. So before we get on to specific areas, if we look how, at how cities have been developing and um, what lies in store in the coming years, uh, why and how are nanomaterials going to play a key role in development of our cities? Yeah, so as a foundation to our discussion, I think first we have to define what makes nanomaterials uh, unique. Mm -hmm. So when we take those materials down to uh, nanom nanometer sizes, uh, they start to exhibit uh, rather unique and uh, sometimes uh, bizarre physical and electronic properties. And so what we're really doing is we're leveraging those uh, bizarre properties within a product, and that becomes the foundation of, of creating innovation uh, through the use of nanomaterials. Uh, you know, in the context of our discussion today, literally all of our infrastructure is materials based. And so this really creates uh, countless opportunities for nanomaterials, but also uh, a, a whole class of advanced materials to have an impact. And, you know, it, it, off the top of my head, I would say, you know, you could think of things like lighter, stronger concrete, self-healing uh, cladding for uh, buildings, depolluting claddings for buildings, insulation. And uh, one of the biggest hands down in terms of dollar terms uh, would be corrosion inhibition. It's a huge drag uh, on, on economies, uh, both in uh, maintenance and replacement cycles. Um, when we talk about um, nanotechnology, both you and I know it's a very broad class of materials. Um, so what would you say are some of the main uh, nanomaterials that can help to develop and innovate, innovate our cities? 
So, so the funny thing here is I'm going to say just about everything. <laughs> and really the, uh, the question is uh, what materials and where, and that really is going to be a, a function of those materials costs. So uh, for physical infrastructure, you know, you just look at the sheer size and scale of a city and you're going to have to use materials that are low cost, high volume. And in my view, I would say for the most part, those are going to be things like metal, metal oxides and ceramics, uh, depending on the application. I know there's been a lot of study into uh, graphene and carbon nanotubes, uh, though generally, you know, the price of those materials is still pretty high uh, to, to, to accommodate high volume. Uh, but, you know, basically what you're looking at is uh, three use cases, in my opinion, you're going to have um, parts that are primarily made of nanomaterials, parts that are augmented uh, by nanomaterials or simply uh, coatings. And then if you, if you look, uh, as you mentioned, you know, uh, industry 4.0, with, with smart sensors there, you can use higher value materials. So you could see precious group metals and, and other things because they do provide uh, some, some interesting um, behaviors to smart sensing and there the material cost isn't as nearly sensitive. And then, you know, finally, uh, there's been so much work done in quantum dots as of late, and I really do see as the price continues to come down that that, that may drive all sorts of new innovation uh, in the uh, smart city, future city space. You know, and when we talk about future cities, I mean, this is quite an ambiguous term. It's like, how, how long in the future are we actually talking about? I mean, how long is it going to be before we start to see, you know, true integration of nanomaterials into our infrastructure and when we'll be able to define, you know, the uh, future city status? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, on the integration, uh, honestly, it's been going on all around us uh, with nanomaterials. Mm -hmm. They're just, you wouldn't be aware of it uh, as the, the regular consumer. And I, I may uh, classify these as uh, Gen 1 innovations. So, you know, you look at something like uh, nickel or aluminum nanoparticles, these are being used in, in wood flooring today uh, to enhance the wear profile. Uh, you're seeing nanomaterials in paints uh, to prevent mold growth. Uh, titanium dioxide is uh, ubiquitously used as a, a brightener in a lot of paints. Uh, but, you know, looking a little bit farther out, you know, within the right in industry and, and government circles, it's very well understood that these population pressures are going to be on us in the next 30 years. So, uh, what you're seeing today is governments uh, investing very heavily in basic research uh, to, to get out in front of these challenges. Corporate labs are certainly doing the same. And uh, I can see it with our customers that, you know, some of those innovations are making their way out of the lab now and uh, into the qualification and commercialization process. Uh, thank you, Landon. Yeah, it's, it's always interesting to know because we're always looking to um, advance our society and infrastructure, and I've done for you know for a long time. And th th there's always going to be plans for you know a future city. Um, so if we look at you know one of the most um, crucial aspects of our cities, and that is obviously the buildings itself. You know, there's a lot of talk about using nanomaterials in building materials, and so where, where, what do you think the biggest impact will be in using uh, nanomaterials in in building and construction materials? And what type of nanomaterials um, do you see being at the forefront? Yeah, so perhaps we should start with, uh, no pun intended, the, the building blocks of cities. So, <laughs> you know, you, you look at something like uh, cement or steel. And uh, to some, this may not be a very interesting topic, but purely from a cost perspective, uh, a maintenance perspective and a replacement cycle perspective, it'll have a huge financial impact. So, you know, you look at cement, uh, silica as a material is used in uh, cement today in a bulk powder form. Uh, but if you add nano silica, uh, you get all kinds of interesting uh, properties. So uh, being able to improve the packing density, which, you know, makes a stronger cement. Uh, you can modify the cement's hydration, uh, which in essence really reduces its setting time and builds uh, strength in the cement very early on so that your, con your construction can uh, move faster. And then probably the most interesting thing to me is the, uh, the ability for silica to prevent the uptake of water in concrete, uh, which helps avoid degradation. 
And uh, weather and more broadly, the environment is definitely one of the largest determining factors on the lifespan uh, of cement. And then if you look at something like, uh, like steel, you know, if you add uh, vanadium or molybdenum nanoparticles into steel, it can reduce fracture problems. Uh, fracture problems ultimately lead to steel failure uh, over time. And I know that uh, it, there's been study as of late around using copper nanoparticles to achieve the same. Uh, another interesting area for me is, is glass, uh, which is also ubiquitous in cities. Uh, you know, there are multiple innovations. I would say the most benign at this point would be something like uh, titanium dioxide coatings on the exterior portion of glass windows. Uh, what happens here is uh, the light activates the uh, nanoparticle, which breaks down organic matter, which then can be uh, simply washed away with the rain. Uh, but for me, the more interesting uh, innovations are, are to come. So it, these would be photochromic and electrochromic uh, coatings. So what you're doing here is you're taking nanoparticles and you're putting them on the, uh, the glass and either through uh, activation of light or activation of small amounts of energy, you can tune whether infrared light comes into the building or not. And, and most importantly, without significantly impacting the clarity of the window. And uh, why is that important? Infrared light uh, generates heat. So, you know, during the summer, you wanna keep that light out. And during the winter, you wanna let that light in. And that's ultimately gonna reduce uh, your energy costs, but also the size of the systems that you need to install. Uh, so, you know, reducing your overall infrastructure costs. Uh, but, you know, it, it, Liam, I'm curious from, from your perspective, uh, what are you seeing being used in, in uh, building materials? Well, as you know, I, I see quite, I know you're involved in the inorganic, I see quite a bit of, you know, the, you know, the organic side of it. Um, and you have touched on it before, um, and there's actually a lot of interest um, and development actually in the graphene space. Um, I won't go into you know um, too much depth because obviously you focus more on the inorganic side. But while, while as you mentioned about the cost, um, on the actual um, property side, there's a, a lot of interest because you can use it as an additive, not as a wonder material kind of status as many you know talk about. Just as like you know your simple your simple um, additive in concrete, cement, and even asphalt has been. A lot of interest for the roads so some of the macro benefits that people are starting to see is reduction actually in the material needed for the construction and this is leading into a reduction like the global it uh, could lead to a reduction in like global co2 emissions because the concrete industry produces a you know quite a, a large amount each year and it could be reduced by up to a couple of percent which globally is, is a could be a big thing on on the other side um asphalt um you know, it's a, and again, it's another reduction in, in material needed for the roads and to make them more wear resistant and longer lasting, which obviously helps to um, reduce potholes and and also wear then on automobiles as well. So there's quite a few bit of green potential in, in, in your basic construction materials from um, graphene. And you can obviously use that in conjunction with um, other things. I mean, there has been, I have seen some interest in using carbon nanotubes. And again, you touched on, on that before. But um, in terms of like refinement of the industry, that, that's not quite at the level of where I'd say graphene is currently at the moment. But if we, so that, that's kind of like my uh, take on where, on, on where I'm seeing it on the organic side. But what do you think are going to be the long-term benefits of using nanomaterials in, in building materials? And how long is it going to be before we start to see, you know, widespread integration and some of, and see some of these potential benefits? Yeah, hands down, from my perspective, uh, the benefit is going to be savings in maintenance costs and being able to use assets uh, like, let's say, a bridge uh, longer before you have to, to replace it. Uh, it, it. The second long-term benefit definitely is going to be energy savings. I, mean, I think there's no question about that. Uh, and, you know, in terms of timing, a lot of these use cases are... Uh, either in the market or, or, or moving into the market. So you look at something like those self-cleaning coatings, uh, they're definitely becoming more widely used. They're pretty pervasive uh, throughout Asia. They're making their way here into uh, the United States. And, you know, I mentioned those infrared attenuating coatings. Uh, these are more early stage uh, from a commercial adoption perspective, but they are in the market. And, uh, you know, 
It, what typically happens here uh, with all innovations, of course, is uh, as adoption increases, price drops, which further encourages more adoption. And, uh, you know, that process tends to happen pretty exponentially. So uh, it, it, then you look at something like concrete. I, I would say that this is a, a wee bit uh, more early stage. Uh, it, there's a lot of testing and qualification that goes into uh, using concrete, obviously, you need to be able to prove not only its performance benefit today, uh, but that it's going to continue to perform 30, 50 years out. And so th these type of innovations traditionally are going to take a lot longer. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that makes sense. And, um, and thank you for the, uh, the insights. Uh, so if we uh, skip on from the building materials and, and go on to the next topic, which is nano coatings. So Nanoteals have been integrated into nanocases more and more these days, and they have been done, you know, for a while now. So what do you think are going to be some of the main ways that nanocoatings are going to be, you know, used in, in our future cities? Yeah, I mean, nano coatings or just coatings in general, I mean, is just mm -hmm. a pervasive technology uh, across just about all the physical infrastructure that, that is out there, um, whether it's your home or, or a city or a building. Um, it, 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 there are overlaps and we should just talk about that mm. for a second. So, you know, I talked about uh, the windows, you know, technically that's a coding, but it, what it enables is a smart glass. So I think maybe what we do here is we talk a little bit more about conventional coatings and uh, the one that goes uh, right to the top of my mind, hands down, is going to be the corrosion of metals. So most people see corrosion, they understand it's a problem, but uh, I think very few actually understand the total magnitude of, of the problem. So, uh, you know, globally today, uh, it, the drag on the economy for maintenance and replacement of, of steel is about $3 trillion. Just in the United States, uh, on our highway system, it's about $300 million per year. It's a staggering amount of money. And uh, corrosion is a, a huge area of, of study and research. Uh, this has been going on for decades. It'll go on for many more decades. Uh, but with nanomaterials, you know, you have a really interesting opportunity. So uh, the nanomaterials themselves obviously have very high uh, surface area compared to a more conventional material. And so it's going to allow that material to interact with the environment more readily. And in, in the case of corrosion, what it can do is it can, uh, you know, prevent or neutralize uh, a corrosive threat before it gets to the underlying material. Uh, you're going to use different, there's no one size uh, fits all solution. You're going to use different materials for different applications. You know, if you're in a high humidity application, you may use different materials than if you're uh, subjected to very high salt spray, let's say, by, by the ocean. Uh, but it, some of those materials that are uh, being looked at and or used, I mean, they're titanium, copper, zinc, zirconia, uh, even Syria. Uh, but the, the list is, is broad and quite extensive. Uh, it, you know, in terms of other coatings, uh, it, one that I personally find very interesting is uh, hollow polystyrene uh, coatings, basically uh, in, in roof paint. And, you know, this is the same material that your beach cooler, your, your uh, throwaway beach cooler is made of. But uh, the idea here is that by incorporating uh, these small particles into the paint, you're actually reducing the ingress of heat uh, into the building, which I find to be just a really fascinating technology. It's not there from a commercialization uh, perspective yet, but uh, very, very interesting work is being done there. So... Uh, Liam, what do you, uh, what areas do you think uh, nano coatings are going to be used across cities? Yeah, I mean, you've touched on it um, there in a couple of areas. I, I mean, I, I think like the general area of like barrier coatings, especially using uh, the different range of inorganic material, inorganic nanomaterials is going to be, going to definitely be one to watch out for. I mean, the, you, you know, I mean, there's so many different inorganic nan nanomaterials out there. Some have a high resistance to temperature, some to corrosion uh, formation, like film formation, uh, harsh chemicals, and even moisture in some cases. So, you know, there's a, there's a wide scope here. So there's everything going to be from anti-corrosion, conformal coatings on buildings, boats, and, you know, thermal barrier coatings in engines, generators, wind turbines, gas turbines, as well as any, you know, any other high heat applications. There's then the potential for anti-biofouling coatings in future healthcare applications. We've talked about healthcare before. 
Um, and then even to like scratch resistance coatings, you know, in, in our displays, windows, car body works, you know, and, and anything else that you don't want to get scratched, basically. And the, I mean, the, the, there's, there's other like, you know, far-fetched kind of like wider areas out there, which, you know, may not come to fruition. Like, you know, people talk about food packaging. I mean, I don't think that's, you know, going to be feasible on a large scale. I think that's going to be more, you know, in specific areas, unless it's sort of like, you know, a really attractive price point. And then you, there's kind of areas like, say, for example, like eco paints, where, you know, you're removing pollutants and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. There's already those kind of paints about and, you know, the integration of, uh, you know, nanomaterials to kind of remove those pollutants. There's, uh, there's some interesting potential there as well, because uh, obviously a lot of um, a lot of cities pretend to produce, you know, a lot of gas. So, I mean, that, that I, I think there's like a, a wide scope in, in that kind of area ac across the range. So, but obviously some are more commercially feasible than others, but what do you, would you say is the commercial level of nano coatings today? Not necessarily from like, you know, production's perspective, but from actually, you know, a real world use perspective. And how long do you think it'll be before we see them rolled out on a global scale? And do you think there's going to be any areas that are going to, you know, emerge before others? Yeah, so it, to me, I think, I mean, there are so many different uh, types of nano coatings for different applications. A lot of them are already in the market in what I would call a, a Gen 1 fashion. Again, uh, most people just wouldn't be uh, aware of it. If we look at uh, the Gen 2 stuff, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about corrosion because it's, uh, it's a passion point for me. Uh, in that market, there is constant innovation happening year over year. And so uh, you're unlikely to see this huge um, sea change in performance, but uh, what you will have is kind of incremental rollout of, of new uh, technology uh, anywhere from every couple of years to maybe uh, five years. And I think you'll, you'll see that steady drumbeat happen uh, over the next five decades, six decades, probably longer, to be honest. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've now talked about a lot, you know, say what we maybe call the core areas, where, you know, of future cities. So if you look at a couple of the fringe areas, um, like first off, I mean, what role do you see nanotails playing in water and air filtration systems in our cities? And how long do you think something like this will, you know, take to roll out on a large scale and kind of, you know, kind of like globally? Yeah, so this is also another area where there is absolutely constant innovation going on. Uh, and it, there are actually quite a few uh, applications out there uh, already using nanomaterials on a very large scale. Uh, you can take things like uh, water purification. So there are nano-enabled membranes uh, on the market. They've been on the market, you know, probably well over a decade. And they'll do things like, you know, softening your water, removing contaminants, you know, whether that's physical, biological, or chemical. Uh, nanomaterials are used in different uh, forms and fashions, also in uh, sewage treatment today. So, you know, basically uh, removing uh, or neutralizing harmful materials. Uh, it could be pharmaceuticals left over in the waste stream where you basically oxidize and, and, uh, and neutralize them. Uh, personal care products in the waste stream, which is uh, almost ever present. And then, a, you know, a future air application that I find uh, really quite interesting is the, the deep polluting coatings. So, uh, you know, here, what most people are focused on is using um, uh, titanium dioxide, uh, primarily in annotase form. And, you know, when activated by light, uh, and when in contact with nitrous oxide, which is a emission byproduct from vehicles, it neutralizes the, the nitrous oxide. Uh, and why is that important? Uh, ultimately, nitrous oxide, while not a greenhouse gas, does um, uh, contribute pretty significantly to, to global warming. Uh, thank you, Lennon. And um, as I kind of a final area and talk about global warming and uh, long-term sustainability, people, when talk about advanced materials, talk about carbon capture, you know, as a, as a method of removing, you know, carbon from our atmosphere especially in in more industrial scale processes so uh, on this area how likely do you think we are to see the widespread use of like carbon capture technologies um or do you think there are any alternative options you know that are better in the pipeline yeah so carbon capture technology i mean it it, it exists today it works 
the problem is the infrastructure cost to uh, put that technology into play, say in like a, an industrial plan. So uh, in my view, the only way that this really gets to market is a, in, a, in a widespread way is either government mandates it or uh, there becomes a market uh, for uh, basically environmental credits uh, or a tax on carbon, if you will. Uh, that is the only way that you're going to see really strong widespread adoption, in my personal opinion. Okay, uh, thank you, Andrew, for that. Um, the, it's, it's a very split. It's a very split from when I hear people on, on carbon ta- capture to yes or no. So it's interesting to um, hear, hear your thoughts on that. Um, but yeah, that's all we um, have time for today, as well. Um, so to everyone watching, hope the areas that we have discussed are not going to only provide some insights in to where material science have an impact in everyday life, but how nanomaterials are, you know, one of the key materials that are going to help to govern our future cities and are already governing our cities at the moment. And that, you know, that when we talk about future cities, we're not only talking about, you know, advanced software algorithms, but, you know, innovation in the physical infrastructure is going to be key for society to advance. So, thank Landon, thank you for all your insights today. Uh, thank you, Liam. I'll see you next time. Thank you. I'll see you next time.